Well, good morning and welcome to our church service this morning on this bright, sunny August day. They're promising us 91 degrees this afternoon, so find a way to stay cool. We've, uh, we've had a busy week at the church and certainly uh, things coming up. You see a few on the slides behind me. Um, Bible study will resume uh, next month on the... Uh, Jack's trying to tell me something. I can't, I can't quite get it, but uh, he has an announcement. He has four pens in his hand, so he's getting ready to write something important. Um, but Bible study will resume next month. It's taking a hiatus currently, um, and uh, last week we had cookie day. Last Sunday we had 32 people at our Hollybrook service, so that was well attended, and uh, as the summer sort of uh, comes to a close with the kids back in school now and the first full week of school ahead of them, uh, choir practices is coming as well. Uh, our first choir practice will be Wednesday, September the 6th at 6, and we'd love to have you join us. So uh, give that some consideration. Uh, there will not be fellowship today. Uh, it will be next Sunday, so uh, if you uh, can come and join us next Sunday, we'd love to have you for coffee and donuts and those sort of things. Um, as you see in your insert, the blue insert, we have several things coming up in the month of September, which is just around the corner. Beyond choir practice, we have uh, Clayton Summers joining us on the 17th as we'll be honoring him for his uh, entry into ministry most recently. Uh, church board meeting on the 20th and uh, Bible study, as I mentioned, resumes on the 21st. So uh, busy time for the church as we head back into the fall routine a little bit. Are there other announcements this morning that we uh, want to make from the congregation? We certainly welcome uh, Marsha Woodcock and Bill Hudson this morning as our special music. We look forward to that. And if there are no other announcements, please prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Please stand and join me for our opening hymn number 91, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
may we know the presence of the Holy Spirit here with us today. May we be open to your leading, sensitive to your speaking, and alert to your calling. Father, we invite the same power that was at work when Jesus raised from the grave to be present with us here now. And we declare that you are welcome here among us as we join together to say the words that your son, Jesus Christ, taught his disciples in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time, if our children would come forward for our, this young disciples moment. Evan, I'll just, I'll use this mic here. All right, you guys and girls, um, you guys want to come up here by me and we'll, let's get around the, the table here. Hello, how are you? Awesome. Okay. What I would like for you guys to do, do you guys remember who gave you this? Do you remember? Do you remember? Okay. Do you guys use your crosses? How do you use your crosses? You hold yours? How about you guys? How do you use yours? Come over here. That's an important thing to say. Luis, speak into the mic and tell the congregation what you just said. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I keep it when I go to school because school's scary. It can be scary. Yeah. Um, You need to get you a cross. Do you have one? No. Well, we'll get you one, okay? Yeah. Well, the cross that was given to us by Becky, okay, her intention was, was that this reminded us of Christ's presence, okay? And we talked about how when we are stressed out or um, scared or we just needed to remember Jesus' presence with us. And uh, this is an important, very important uh, gift she gave us. Are there other reminders of Christ's presence and God's love for us in this room? What do you see? The 
candles. Christ is the light of the world. That's a very important one. What else do you see? Do you see any other crosses anywhere? Yeah, I like that because that reminds us when we walk in here. What's that? I see the flag. And the Christian flag and the American flag. But I'm talking about signs of God's presence. Okay? How about you got the cross up there? You see any other crosses in here? Yeah, you got that one. Any other crosses in here? That one. Yeah. What I'd like for you to do when you're on the stained glass windows, take a look at those and see what images are there to remind us of that. It's okay. What images are in here? And there's one ultimate image in here that we might not really see as God's presence. You see all those people out there? All those people has God's presence in their heart, and they're here to worship God and, and the Holy Spirit. That's right. They have the Holy Spirit, and that's why we come together as one body in Christ, okay? All right. So today during our worship, kind of look around in the congregation and see what kind of reminders of Jesus are there. Okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, we're so very thankful for this place that we can come here and we can be reminded of your presence. We give you thanks for the crosses that Becky has given us and that they remind us of your presence. Oh God, be with these children as they continue to go to school here soon and help them in their studies. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I know that you know, but I'm going to share this again, that we extend our deepest sympathy to Becky Jackman's family. Becky went home to be with the Lord on Thursday, on August 17th. Her service will be held here at this church on September 9th at 2 o'clock with a visitation prior to the service. We ask that you keep Joe, Rob, Kate, and the rest of her family in your prayers at this very difficult time of loss. But also, may we remember that Becky is a child of God, and she is in the presence of Christ, and Revelation teaches that she's aware of what's going on here. And she makes prayers for us, and she gathers with us around the Lord's table today. May this rose remind you of those facts. The red rose is in celebration, and I of Andrew Wayne, poacher, and uh, the family tells me that he is like another little Henry, and uh, we pray for the family. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're so very excited, and we are so blessed, and the family is so blessed, uh, and we celebrate with them. Also, Edna uh, spoke with her this past week, and she really appreciates how you all have reached out to her. Uh, and some of you contacted her when she is just about to have uh, feelings of extreme loneliness, and you helped get rid of that, uh, that feeling because you were there with her. 
We also remember Fred Zonders in our prayers this morning. Uh, Fred uh, had a slight stroke and was taken to Gateway. He's back at home and uh, he's back to normal. Please remember the rest of those concerns that are in our list this morning. And we, in faith, place these before Christ at his table. And now let us share in, our, in the singing of the prayer hymn as we prepare our hearts for a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we have this place as your children to gather together, to worship, but also to fill your presence with one another. Because from the very first breath we take to the last one we release, we are blessed by your constant presence. O oh God, with grateful hearts, we give you thanks. You are a compassionate Lord, and you hear the sigh of each one here who reaches out to you today. O oh God, so many of us have experienced 
some heartache this past week. And we are still broken. And we're here today that you might heal our hearts. Remind us of your love and your presence with us. And now, O oh God, we offer to you those concerns, along with those concerns which are listed in our bulletins. And we place all of our burdens before you in this moment of silence. Now, O oh God, remind us that you invite us not only to the comfort of prayer, but also to the place of care where our lives can offer the gift of great compassion. This week, give us the courage to speak a word of grace when it may not be easy to speak, to be a listening ear when we are tempted to give easy advice, to reach out with a secret act of service that may never be discovered. Oh God, we ask that you bless this congregation and its ministries. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Our gracious and loving God calls us to be stewards of his abundance, the caretakers of all that he has entrusted to us. May we use our gifts wisely to teach and to share them generously with others and send the Holy Spirit to work through us, bringing his message to all those that we serve. Let us now receive our morning offering.
giver of life and source of freedom, we know that all we have is received from your hand. Gracious and loving God, you call us to be stewards of your abundance, caretakers. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and to teach us to share them with others. Send the Holy Spirit to work through us, bringing your message to those we serve. And may our faithful stewardship be a witness to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. We pray with grateful hearts in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for sharing with us today. That was very, you put the special in special music. Thank you. This morning's scripture lesson 
comes from Jesus' grandfather, King David, in Psalm 139. Hear now the word of the Lord. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is a light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty To me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. And I come to the end. I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. The proper response is, thanks be to God. Everyone here, I think, knows that my door is always open, especially to those that need a word. A word of comfort, advice, or a prayer. You see, throughout my years in ministry, there have been people that have come in who have been crushed by others or by life itself. Sometimes they make statements like the following. My mistakes have been so awful, so awful, that there's no way to repair the damage or everything I attempt fails. I'm just a jinxed person, or I'm not useful or needed by anyone. I'm just good for nothing. Recently, one person came to the office, and they were so hurt by another Christian, they did not know what to do. They knew what to do. And they ended up forgiving the person that hurt them so badly and were able to move on. But sometimes they just feel as though I'm just good for nothing. And they can't get out of that. They're stuck. It's times like that that the proper and only response is to do it gently, but to ask, who gave you the right to judge yourself? And they kind of give me the look, 
You see, only God has a right to make a final evaluation on all of us and you. You're not your own maker. And you and I know who the maker is. He is God Almighty. Our God loves his children unconditionally. In fact, he even loves sinners unconditionally. Romans says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves all his children. But we all come to a point where we say, well, do I really matter to God? Does God really care? Yes, God cares. How do I know? Because scripture teaches us that before you were God's idea, you were God's idea before your parents even thought about conceiving you. God spoke these words to his servant Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Because every person is originally, according to scripture, God's idea. And that makes no one ordinary. No one. You are special in the sight of God because you bear a striking resemblance to God our Father. Scripture teaches you were made in the image of God. That doesn't mean little caricatures, that we're miniature gods, but it does mean that we have been made with godly capacities. We are spiritual, rational, moral, and immortal creatures. Though sin has soiled and distorted our godly image, we are still reflections of the Lord God, our Father. We are as different from other creatures as animals are different from vegetables. You see, in Genesis 1, verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make humans in our image, in our likeness, and let them have stewardship over the entire earth. The psalmist declared, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we are. Devin, I should have checked with you, but I'm going to say this, but if I'm incorrect, you'll tabulate and give us the proper measurements on this illustration. Okay? Did you realize, if I'm correct, that if the DNA strands from your body were stretched out in sequence. They would reach to the sun and back four times. Approximately 93 million miles. Devin, is that pretty accurate? Okay. Think about that. The DNA that God created in you. Think about that. Wow. You see it every day, every, every so often, if you cut your finger while maybe peeling an apple, your flesh will heal itself automatically. You see, our bodies is a complex, marvelous creation made in the image of God. And here's a third reason for believing that you're special in God's sight, and probably the most important. Luis said it this morning when he was up here. God sent his son into the world. And that cross reminds us of that fact. According to Genesis, Adam and Eve forfeited their godly heritage in a misguided attempt to seize the prerogatives of God. Adam and Eve wanted to be 
equal to God rather than stewards of God. And all generations since then have come into this world with a, shall we say, a spiritually sin-tainted DNA. That God loved us so much that God offered a way for us to reclaim our rightful place as his children. It cost God tremendously. The Son of God agonized on the cross in order to pay the penalty for the sin in the world. For God so loved the world, John says, that he gave his only begotten Son. And then probably the most important scripture, section of scripture in the epistles is Romans chapter 5. God died for us while we were sinners, enemies, hopeless. And he goes on, he says, how much more does God love us now as a child of God? Wow. Wow. Those categories, sinners, enemies, hopeless. And that's when God loved us. You matter to God. You are loved. Last of all, you should know how special you are to the Lord our God. Because even the least of us is of enormous value to God. Luke in his gospel tells of the day when Jesus was on his way home to the home of Jairus. Jairus was the equivalent of a mayor and bishop at the same time. He was a dignitary in that little community. And Jairus' daughter was dying. A large crowd was on the road with Jesus and suddenly Jesus stopped the parade. Why? Why? Because he wanted to deal with a person who was regarded to be at the very bottom of the social totem pole. Legend has it that this woman was a Gentile from Caesarea Philippi. And if so, she was regarded as of little or no value to the Jewish people. That patriarchal society at that time. Even worse, she was suffering from internal bleeding. And that made her ceremonially unclean, according to the Old Testament Jewish law. She was not even supposed to be out in public in that condition. And that's when Jesus said, somebody touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Hmm. Somehow this woman knew immediately that she had been healed. It must have been embarrassing for her to step forward. You see, this woman believed that her suffering was due to some sin in her life. But Jesus responded in love. He didn't judge. He didn't condemn. He was content to solve her physical problem, but he also wanted to heal her spirit too. He wanted her to know that she was forgiven. And then he said these amazing words to someone outside of the Jewish community. Daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus made that Jewish dignitary wait until he first dealt with a considered nobody? who in that moment discovered that she was really somebody, a child of God. Wow. You know, if you remove our triune God from the picture, 
Human values sink like a rock. And those values are being forsaken these days in our culture and cultures across the world. There's so much chaos now. If you are just an accident as the communists and Darwinians theorize, you have little value. In fact, you have no value. Just as a Jew was worthless in the eyes of Hitler and the Nazis, just as the Israelis and Palestinians, some regard each other as a scum of the earth and they shouldn't be here, If you remove God from the picture, none of us has any worth whatsoever. None. Our worth becomes not one penny unless we have some utilitarian purpose and value to the powers that be. Another communist socialist context was during the time of Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel, The Cancer Ward, has a young political prisoner named Oleg. And he's talking to a nurse named Zoya. Reading from the patient records in the cancer ward, Oleg notices that hardly any people actually actually die in that ward. And he asks Zoya about this. She says, we discharge the patients before they die. Once we see that the patient is beyond help, we move him or her out and make room for people we can help. That made sense under the Soviet socialist system that declared that God was dead. If God was dead, you see, human worth was not established by God. Therefore, the government or system establishes what is human worth. Now contrast that cancer ward with the ministry of the late Mother Teresa in India. She provided shelter and help for the homeless, the AIDS victims, the poor, the dying, the forgotten. And when she was asked why, she explained, they are created by God, and that's why they deserve to die with dignity as children of God. Christianity and our Lord and Savior never judges people by how useful they are. They are children of God. They matter to God. And if you ever have those moments where you start to question, does God really care about you? Do you matter? In your circumstances we talked about last week, do, do I really matter? Of course you do. He made you in his image and he redeemed you on the cross, on the cross. Brothers and sisters, may your time with the Lord at his table today remind you of how important you are to God and how important everybody in this room and outside this room is to God. Please stand and sing our hymn of dedication. Thank you.
all are invited to the Lord's table to experience God's love. And may you feel in your heart of hearts the love of God, O oh child of God. Let us pray. Sometimes, O oh God, our lives seem dried out, shriveled up, and parched of meaning. It is only when we turn to you, the wellspring of joy and love, that we can be truly refreshed. There your spirit gives us new life, transforming our inner deserts into gardens. Thank you for this communion given to us by Jesus Christ our Lord that represents new life and life abundant. Let this bread and cup remind us to turn to you for the refreshment and renewal of spirit we so desperately need but so rarely seek. We pray in the name of Jesus who invites us to this table. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, let us remember that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the loaf, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, my blood shed for the sins of the world. Take and drink. Gracious God, we remember, we remember your love for us. While we were still sinners, enemies, without hope in this world, that you sent your son into this world to die for the sins of the world. We claim that, O oh God. Now help us with your Holy Spirit to live within that truth as we face these challenging days. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. no wood. It's okay. May the light of Christ and the love of God be with you as you enter into this world that so much needs God's love. Mm -hmm.